Members, Mr. Juan Dobson has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clark, please, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health to outline the measures she is taking following the withdrawal of the GP contractor confirmed to accept the contract to run the Banview Medical Practice. I call the Minister of Health. The HSCB widely advertised the GP contract for Banview Practice, met a number of practices and held an information evening with practices in the surrounding areas. They also provided information and support that would be available to a new contractor taking on the Banview Practice. Despite all their efforts, no applications were received by the closing date of the 2nd of December 2016. The HSCB continued their efforts to secure a contractor for the Banview practice and having identified an interested GP, they held a number of very positive meetings with the prospective contractor. Consequently, on 5 January 2017, a new GP contractor confirmed to the Health and Social Care Board that they would take on the Banview medical practice from early March 2017. Yesterday, unfortunately, that contractor officially withdrew their intention to take on the practice. This is an extremely disappointing development, and I met with the HSCB today to ensure that patients will continue to receive safe and high-quality health care, and that all possible options for a permanent solution are being considered. The HSCB have confirmed to me that they are actively seeking to secure a permanent GP contractor to take over the Banview practice. They are also exploring other options, including the Southern Trust taking on the contract for Banview. The Board will continue to manage the practice and ensure that GP services are provided to the patients of the practice whilst they work to secure a new contractor to take over the practice. No decision has been made to close the practice. I fully appreciate the, that patients are concerned about the current situation, but I can reassure them that every effort is being made to secure a permanent solution for the practice and that the Board will be writing to all patients to advise them of the current arrangements. I set out in Health and Wellbeing 2026 the importance of primary care, and I have confirmed my intention to invest significantly in primary care. The future model of primary care must be focused on keeping people healthy and well, and must be based on multidisciplinary teams embedded around general practice. I have already announced plans to have named district nurses, health visitors and social workers for every GP practice to support the development of new roles such as physician associates and advanced nurse practitioners, and our continued investment in practice-based pharmacists will see over 100 in place in the near future. I also intend to invest in technology to help transform the way general practice works and to improve the services to patients. To that end, I have confirmed the further rollout of the Ask My GP system. Given my focus on supporting and investing in primary care, I have also announced an increase to 111 GP training places over the next two years. There has been significant investment in GP-led services over recent years. This year, in 16-17, saw the investment of up to 7 million in GP services following contract negotiations, building on an investment of up to 5 million made last year. These commitments, which will help to ease the workload of GP pressures and attract more doctors into general practice, will build on the already significant investment in general practice over recent years and reflect some of the recommendations of the GP-led working group. I have accepted all of that group's recommendations as signalling the direction of travel needed to ensure that everyone here continues to have access to high quality, sustainable GP led services. I ask the member, Minister if she needs more than the two minutes to answer the question she just asked. I call Ms. Joanne Dobson for her supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, this is a desperate situation which has caused real anger in Portadown and has the potential to impact on the health of all patients on the health centre, creating a domino effect across the practices. Portadown must be prevented from becoming Humpty Dumpty. What is your response to the anger of the patients in Portadown and was the contract actually signed as a stalling tactic because of the organised patients' rally? Yes. Well, I can say to all patients that they will continue to receive safe clinical services and that the board will monitor that. We have in place um, medical and nursing cover. We have arrangements with Dalriada practice in terms of out of hours. We have uh, independent prescribers, all working as collectively as part of a team to make sure the patients have 
the access to first class GP services which they rightly are entitled to. I think it's important that we don't scaremonger. I think it's important that we are responsible about this. What I will ensure and the board of, uh, uh, we've asked the board to do is to write to every member of the surgery to make sure that they're fully abreast of the situation. But I can assure you, I don't make public announcements in the back of, um, of any potential public rally or anything like it. I made the announcement in relation to um, Bandview practice because a contractor had in fact confirmed that he was going to take on the practice, but since then has realised that he wasn't able to fulfil the obligations of the contract. So that is why we have found ourselves in a situation where as of yesterday, lunchtime, the contractor officially confirmed to the board that he is no longer able to have the practice or to, to enter into the contract with the department. So what's most important here is that patients continue to see, receive their um, safe clinical services and the board, as I said, are going to monitor that. But ultimately, what we need is a permanent solution here. This is obviously a temporary arrangement to try and get us to make sure that we're supporting the patients on the ground. Well, it is a temporary arrangement because what we're working towards is making sure we have a permanent solution. And I think we'll have to be very creative about how we do that. I think long gone are the days where the only solution to GP services is where a GP becomes an independent contractor, an individual business person in their own right. I think the fact that the, the makeup of GPs are now a prominently more female workforce, more people who want a bit more flexibility. Not every GP wants to be a contractor. Some GPs want to be salaried GPs. So I think we need to move towards that. We're engaged with the Southern Trust around how they can get involved here and play their, their role. But I do believe that what we have in place now is making sure we provide safe patient services. I absolutely accept that um, people are worried about the future of their GP practice. That's absolutely understandable. I also accept that the surrounding GPs who are under tremendous pressure, which we already know, are actually feeling the impact of it all. So what we need here is a permanent solution. And I can assure all the patients that that's absolutely what we're working towards. What we have in place now is a temporary solution, but I can assure you that as of um, the meeting which I had with the board earlier on today, we, there is GP cover, medical cover and nursing cover all in place right up into the next six weeks and they'll continue to make sure we have rotas filled and cover that until we have a permanent solution and there are a number of options in relation to the permanent solution. The fact is no GP, only one GP expressed an interest in relation to the applications or the advertisement to come forward. So that's, that's a wider issue which we have here in relation to recruitment of GPs. But we do have to look at other ways of how we can have GPs in place. And I think looking towards salary GPs is certainly one option we need to explore an awful lot more. Call Ms. Carla Lockhart. Thank you. And can I thank uh, the Minister for her answer thus far? I have to say, Minister, this has been a very worrying time for the people of Portadown, and particularly those who are sick and very vulnerable at this time. Uh, we have sick children. I know a lady of 102 who is very ill at this time, and this is causing undue distress for her and her family. I do believe there was irresponsible politicking around stating that a contractor had been found when we all knew that there was difficulty and that it was not at an advanced stage. So I would call on you, Minister, to give assurances to the people of Portadown today that they will be looked after and that the care and the level of care that they require will be provided by the contractors that you have put in place in this uh, short-term period. Well, let, let's, be, let's be very, very clear again that patients will continue to receive very safe clinical care, that there is staff in place, medical staff, nursing staff, prescribers all involved in making sure the patients receive first-class care and that's the guarantee which the board have given and the board will continue to monitor that situation. So let's be very, very clear in the message we're sent to the public because I absolutely am involved in responsible politicking, I can assure you, and I wouldn't make an announcement in relation to um, securing a contract if I didn't actually believe that that was to be the case. When the board confirmed with me, the contractor had confirmed that he was willing to take up the position. So we find ourselves in a difficult situation, but we have to chart our way through it. And the best way to do that is to find a permanent solution. I've offered up how I believe I think we can do that. We're engaged with the Southern Trust around potentially their involvement. Um, and I think that is looking towards salary GPs, because obviously this issue has arose as a result of this was a practice that had four GPs, two, con two main contractors and two salary GPs. Two uh, individual, one contractor left, the other one fell under pressure in relation to whenever two other salaried GPs went off on maternity leave, not receiving the proper locum cover, they couldn't attract it. So a combination of factors have led us to this. But what we need to make sure the public are assured of, we want, we want to make sure they have first class GP services. And that's what the board are, are, are doing and making sure that that's in place. And we'll continue to monitor it. But we need a longer term solution here. And, and we're actively working to find that. Call Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her answers thus uh, far. 
without a doubt the situation at Banview is a very serious one and we all hope that a solution can be achieved. However, sadly, it is symptomatic of a wider crisis engulfing general practice. The Minister had announced, I think it was on the 23rd of December, uh, measures that she would be implementing to assist general practice, and this was very welcome. However, now, in the absence of an executive, in the absence of a budget, what short-term measures can the Minister implement to assist and to help general practitioners deliver care to patients in need? Well, as I said, I, I did, and you're right, on the 23rd of December, I announced that I would take forward the recommendations from the DP-led um, working group, which charted out, I suppose, a number of key issues which needed to be dealt with in the short, medium and longer term. I've said that I am um, absolutely um, wedded to making sure we take those things forward. And that's a whole, um, there's a whole range of issues without listing them all. It's about looking at multidisciplinary teams, so who else can we put in to support the GP? GPs, as I said, and recognise, are under tremendous pressure, so we have to make sure that we do everything we can to support them. And I believe the best way we can do that is to further enhance things, for example, like Ask My GP. And we, we're committed to, in the short term, we have committed to additional um, Ask My GP being re uh, rolled out to an additional 30 surgeries. We have increased the number of um, pharmacists being placed within GP services. Those are all things that are going to help to take the pressure off GPs in the immediate term. The longer term solution is actually looking at one, and I've already announced that I'm going to do it, train more GPs, and there's, because there is an absolute shortage. But also the point I made earlier is a really key one. Traditionally in the past, the workforce of GPs would have been traditionally a male and older generation. There's an ageing population there. We now have a lot more females employed, actually more females than males employed as GPs or in the GPs, working as GPs, and they don't all, not just the females, even the males, not everybody wants to be an independent contractor. So let's look at more flexible ways of allowing GPs to work. So, for example, can trust be involved in actually contracting GPs to work for them and provide services for their community? That's absolutely in line with my vision for health and social care. That's where I believe that we need to, we need to move towards. So I think it's a combination of factors. In the immediate term, we just need to keep working. The board, the trusts need to keep working with GPs to make sure that any of those GPs that are identified as under pressure, and there are a number of them, then we need to make sure that in areas that, such as that, that we're forward planning, that we're realising what's potentially coming down the line, particularly in relation to retirements, and making sure that we have succession planning in place and, and plans to make sure they can pick up the slack where other GPs maybe perhaps retire, for example. I call Mr Doug Beatty. Uh, Mr Speaker, thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you for your uh, answers uh, so far. You didn't create the problem uh, in general practice. Um, it's been a, a long-term problem uh, through underinvestment, but this is about uh, 5,200 people in Banview practice who are extremely uh, scared at this moment in time. On the 5th of January, you said uh, a contract had been secured. You then went on to say, I can confirm that a new contract provider will be in place from early March. And it beggars the question, before you rushed out that statement, did you test that contractor? Did you test to make sure they had the workforce about them to be able to take on the Banview practice? Or was this about getting something out quickly to, to put a sticking plaster on a problem and save face? Well, I just think it's unhelpful. I think we shouldn't scare them longer. Patients are worried and we should all accept that. And the best thing that you could do as an elected representative is to assure those patients that everything's being done to make sure that they have a service. Well, you can, either, you can ask me a question and accept my answer or not, and that's entirely up to yourself. The message I want to send to patients is that absolutely everything's being done to make sure that there are clinician teams, medical teams, nursing staff, pharmacists, all in place to provide the service in the meantime whilst we find a permanent contract. I have no interest. It would not be in my interest whatsoever to stand up and make a statement that says I confirm I have a contractor if I didn't believe I had a contractor. At that moment in time, when I issued the statement, it was to one, provide the clarity to the situation which you've all been asking for, but two, to make sure those patients were informed and knew exactly that something was going to be more permanent. And at that moment in time, that's exactly what the contractor said he could do. But unfortunately, reasons for his own have decided that he cannot fulfill the contract. So we're now in a situation where we're absent again from a contractor. So you're, you're absolutely right. It's not of my making, but it's absolutely my determination to fix it. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. And uh, I thank the Minister for coming along today in relation to this particular issue. Minister, the current situation in Banview um, uh, medical practice in Portadown is in crisis. It's in a serious situation. And for to come along and for statements to be put out that we have secured a contract or such like, 
People are, have since stopped believing everything. They're, they're telling me they're being told lie upon lie, and they're asking, was this another lie, and maybe was that used to stop the protest that was uh, being set up last uh, uh, Friday evening, whatever it was, to, to carry out that protest, in which they quite rightly called off, believing that they would not uh, uh, they would get a contractor in place. They feel really let down, and there has to be a solution to this. And Minister, do you not agree that it's now more than ever the time for you to focus all your time and energy to secure the best medical practice in Portadown Health Centre and to stop your politics and, and to make use of it at this time, running around and putting politics before Portadown Health Centre? I'm elected, so I believe I'm in politics. Um, I think that, let, let's be very clear about one thing, I believe in people power. If the people wanted to go to the streets, I absolutely support that. I'd actually be with them on many, many occasions and have done over the years. So that's not a problem. Let's not pretend that there was a, 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 some sort of attempt to try and sway or dampen down the protest that may or may not have happened. I wouldn't have a problem if the protest happened. If people are that concerned, then they, should, they can make their voice be heard. That's not a problem. But don't you scaremonger. I'm telling you that absolutely everything's being done. I'm telling you, as I stand before you today, that there's clinician teams, there's medical teams, there's the nurses, there's doctors, there's pharmacists in the practice trying to provide the best possible service. The board are continuing to monitor it. I can't say it any other way, but that is a temporary solution. I want a permanent solution, and I use every bit of my best efforts to make sure I find that permanent solution, and have done continually, and will continue to for as long as I hold office. Well, Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, for coming today and answering the question of, of Ms. Dobson. Um, I'm not quite as confident uh, as I was a few months ago that you'll be able to deliver on the reform process that you set out in, the, in your um, pathway that was um, influenced by Professor Ben Goa, given that you don't have your budget now. So um, I think that this problem will get better before it gets sooner, and I think it's very lamentable that we're now going into an election when we should be delivering on transformation. Um, when I was listening to the radio this morning, um, one of the patients from Banfield was on, and they had talked about um, the lack of information coming. And I, I welcome that you said that the health trust, the health board, would be letting them know. But what are you doing in the interim around? preventing those patients who are frail and elderly, as Ms Lockhart outlined there, from not going to emergency departments. Because at the minute there is a lack of information out there, and as we know, the emergency departments are already under tremendous pressure, especially in that area. Well, I, mean, I agree with you in terms of um, keeping patients informed. They need, to, they need to know exactly what's happening, and that's what, what they will do. There will be a letter that will go out to them to inform them exactly of the current situation. Um, and, and you're right in terms of the transformation journey. We, we, I set out delivering together the direction of travel for the next 10 years. All parties more or less signed up to the, that vision, and that, that's the transformation journey which we all recognise we, we need to go on. It also was recognised very clearly right across all the staff and all the patients and people that I engaged with that this was, people were starting to get excited about the transformation. They knew that this was something that needed to happen. It was long overdue. So for the first time, people could start to see there's a way forward here that we needed to change and we were going to radically change how we do things. We were going to change the picture around the focus on primary care, including GPs and the multidisciplinary teams around them. The fact that we know that it's going to be interrupted because of the scenario we find ourselves in is as disappointing to me as it is to yourself. And the reason that we're in this situation is because people need to have confidence in these institutions. That whenever you're taking tough decisions in relation to whether that be transformation, education service or any other service, People need to have confidence in the integrity of these institutions, in the integrity of the ministers of these institutions. And unfortunately, we're in the scenario we are because of the actions of the DUP and their continued arrogance. So that, for me, is the biggest issue. That, for me, is the biggest issue in relation to um, lack of budget. But I, I, I would say this to all the health and social care staff who, who have actually been taken to the top of the hill in relation to the transformation journey and are so. I want to get back to my desk. I, would do, I want to make these institutions work, but they can only work on the basis of equality because that's the only way that people will have, will have confidence in the decisions that I take as a minister or any other minister for that matter. Can I ask you, members, members, members the minister must be heard when replying to questions. Can I call Paula Bradley? And can I thank the Minister for her uh, answers thus far? Uh, Minister, to say we're extremely disappointed, I think, is an understatement, and I don't think anybody is scaremongering. And I think it's rather disappointing that you have to continually blame everything in the DUP's arrogance, I think, as one member of this party. 
I have supported you 100% as chair of, this, of the health committee. As we all did in health committee, we decided to take the politics out of health, and I still want to take the politics out of health. But we are at a, we are at the end of the road when it comes to the GP crisis, especially in Portadown. But not only in Portadown. This week, my colleague Mr. Humphrey and I are meeting with a, a GP practice that spans over North and West Belfast. So this is becoming a Belfast issue as well. I still want to support the way forward. I still want to support the stuff that you have said today in bringing about a better way of working in GP practices, multidisciplinary teams and social workers. I hear what you're saying. What I want to know is when are we going to see that? We need to see that as soon as possible. I don't know how far down the line we are with Portadown and will we ever see if that, but we have GP practices right across Northern Ireland that are crying out for help. So those multidisciplinary teams, social workers, whoever else need to be put in ASAP into those practices to save all our other practices in Northern Ireland. I thank the member for um, her contribution. And I, I, mean, I agree. I'm as disappointed as you are or anybody else is in relation to the fact that this contract that we thought was secured has now fallen through. Nobody's more disappointed than me. And I thought this was the issue that patients could finally feel comforted in the fact that there was a permanent solution there. We don't have a permanent solution yet, but I do believe there's a permanent solution there. So the temporary arrangements, we have to make sure that people feel assured. That's, that's just responsible. To make sure people feel and patients feel assured that what's there now is clinically safe that there are services on there in the, in the practice for patients and that the board will continue to monitor that. The longer term solution we have to find, and I do believe that we can be, push the boundaries out here and do things that maybe haven't been done before. The Southern Trust, I need to step up here. One of the areas that we looked about, and, and the, the, the members rightly said, I welcome the fact that we had a good relationship with the health committee in terms of the engagement. And I absolutely believe in taking the politics out of health. That's the only way we should actually deal with this issue. And I think that uh, in terms of going forward, we have to, for me, I'm as wedded to that transformation journey as I ever was. Um, I very much enjoyed seven months in being the health minister, and I believe the transformation um, journey and the Delivering Together document, which most people were able to sign up to, is the most positive piece of work which the health services have seen in, long, in quite a number of years. People were up for the change, they were up for the transformation. But the reality is, the, reali the reality is, the reality is, in order for people to, to have confidence in the tough decisions that needed to be taken in terms of transformation and where we needed to go, they needed to have confidence in the integrity of these institutions. They needed to have confidence that the decisions were being taken for the right reason. And they needed to know that the ministers taking the decision had a quality at their core, had integrity, and that they didn't disrespect the issues of... They, they, the backbenchers can shout all they wish. This issue and the reason we're in this situation that we're in is because of DUP arrogance, pure and simple. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. Gentlemen, may I, thank, may I thank the Minister for her comments so far and coming through. Uh, just a point of clarification. You mentioned Dalriada. Dalriada out of hours service is an excellent out of hours service. I've used it many times for my children, but the Minister must be aware that it's under severe pressure at the moment and it's based in Balamina. How is it going to cover the people of Portadown? There's arrangements in place in terms of a phone triage service, so that can be done no matter where you are. So um, there's no, the, the board are confident that that is an arrangement that works. It works for Dalriada. They're happy to provide the service. So again, it's part of the, 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 the I suppose, the solution in the interim to, pr to provide services to people. So again, I just can't stress enough. Let's not scare them over. Give patients the comfort which they need. People are sick. People need, if they need services, then they deserve to be supported and they deserve to get all the information possible. I make sure that happens. I'll make sure that they receive letters to confirm exactly the case that we're in. And I will make sure that every day that I'm in office that we work to provide a solution, a permanent solution. But let's be very, very clear. There is a temporary interim solution in place. This is about patients. This is about making sure that we're all responsible and making sure that they know that what can be provided for them is being provided for them. And I can give that assurance. Well, Mr. Roy Baird. GP services are vital, particularly for the, the old and the very young, but indeed any of us who may have an ailment. Uh, so it must be uh, of great concern to all of us the inability of the Health and Social Care Board and indeed the Department and the Minister to ensure that there is alternative GP services available in Porter Down. Given that there is no budget set for 2017-18, that we are now in the face of election, can the Minister advise what action can she actually take to ensure that there are GP services for all citizens in Northern Ireland, including uh, my own constituents, uh, patients of the Antrim uh, Coast Medical Practice, uh, where a similar situation is emerging 
and the long-serving GP Dr Glover, after many years of valiant service, is retiring at the end of March. Uh, again, the Glenarm situation, we're act, again, the board are working with the practice and working with local GPs to try and find a solution there, and I believe that we can find a solution in relation to covering uh, the practice that is now going to be vacated. So I think that there are absolutely solutions there, and we're working in advance of, and, and making sure that we do have, as I said earlier, we need to make sure that we're planning for change, change that we know is going to happen, potential resignations that are coming down the line. We need to make sure that all things are in place. So that, that work's ongoing. The board doesn't stop working. The board will continue to work and make sure that we um, have something in place for Glenarm and for that wider Cushendaw and that wider East Andrew area, but also in relation to the budget. The budget for me, is I am as disappointed as anybody that I can't continue with my transformation journey, but I can keep rehearsing it here if you wish. The reality is we're in this scenario because of the arrogance of the DUP, because of their lack of integrity, because of their lack of listening to the public in relation to the latest RHI scandal. I don't want to be here, but unfortunately we are. Call Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, I hear what you're saying in relation to Portadown. Unfortunately, however, the situation is about to be replicated in County Fermanagh, where over 30 per cent of GPs are due for retirement within the next two years. Um, what steps are you taking at the moment and in the future to, to mitigate against surgeries not being filled? And again, Fermanagh is another issue which um, is an ongoing conversation with the board and they are actively engaged with neighbouring GPs in relation to trying to provide services and looking at the best configuration of those services. So there's nobody sitting on their hands. This work's ongoing and making sure that we're planning for the future. We know of the challenges in Fermanagh and that's actively being worked on also. Call Mr Robbie Butler. Mr Speaker, and I thank you, Minister, for attending today. Uh, it was late last week when uh, the first tentacles of this news was breaking and we were getting little feeds of information. And in the week where you would allege that DUP arrogance has brought these institutions to its knees, I sat on a health committee where your own party didn't feel fit to represent uh, the constituents that you have concern for today. What confidence can you give uh, the people of Northern Ireland uh, as a part of an executive uh, up to last week that really the two parties before us actually have the heart of the health of the people that we represent at their core and that this isn't all politicking? Yeah. Yeah. I take my responsibility very seriously and from I've come into post I've been out, I've been engaging, I've been talking to patients, carers, staff, anywhere that anybody wanted to chat about their current issues and their current feelings about the health service. Very quickly picked up on the key issues which needed to be addressed. I set out the transformation journey, I've set out the direction of travel, I've set out a plan on how we can transform the health and social care system. People have really got on board with that plan, absolutely, really good will for it, really wanted it to work. And unfortunately now, because of the scenario that we're in, then we can't deliver, or at least it's going to be interrupted. So I think for me, this is disappointing, as, it, as I said, this is disappointing for me as it is for anybody else in relation to the transformation journey which I have embarked on. But the plan is there, the strategy is there. There's been a lot of work that's been done in the first seven months. I had set out a number of key issues which we deliver in, on year one, and we're well on our way to delivering all of those. So for me, that's... That that's, that's the key. It has to be about that transformation. We have to deliver real and meaningful change. I've been up for it. I think that anybody who works in the health service can see that I was up for that transformation. Members, that concludes the item of business. I ask the members to take a raise while we change the top table.